Hello, this is Jason Williams with the UNM EMS Academy. Today we're going to be talking about orthopedic trauma. Okay, so as far as general splinting, so let's talk about general principles, specific types, and uh, what specific types you should use. So the first type of splint that I'll mention here is something called a sugar tongue. Uh, this is a photo, or it's actually, sorry, a drawing of the sugar tongue here in place. So the sugar tongue can be uh, placed on a patient who has a varying, who has basically any type of orthopedic injury within the long bones, um, specifically the lower extremity long bones. So it's great for radius ulna. It's also great for um, any type of ankle uh, fracture as well. So the sugar tongue can be used with a SAM splint and is most often used with a SAM splint. And it actually gets its name because once you fold it out and basically it's it's going around either side of the arm here. So once you fold it out like that, it kind of looks like the old sugar tongs that you'd use to grab a sugar cube and put it in your, you know, your mixed drink or whatever you're drinking. Um, so sugar tong works great with a SAM splint. And the nice thing about it is that specifically if we have to, in this situation, isolate the joint above and below, if it is a suspected radius ulna fracture, this isolates the wrist. It also isolates um, the hinge joint at the elbow as well. Um, so sugar tongue is great. It also provides protection for uh, the extremity on either side. Just make sure that you conform the SAM splint to the other arm before you uh, put it on the fractured extremity and then wrap and then check your pulses again and you're set to go. So this picture on the left, this is a good example of a sugar tongue in place on a suspected ankle fracture. And what you'll see here is that the person's boot is still on and I took these pictures from uh, Bob Quinn, Dr. Quinn, who is a uh, orthopedic physician at UNM and he does a lot of wilderness medicine. We teach a lot of courses together and it's his recommendation that anytime you have somebody in specifically a mountain environment or a remote environment to leave their boot on and splint and then transport. And the reason being is because it provides protection for the person. You can actually still assess their circulation status by uh, checking for uh, overall sensation in that extremity by grabbing their toe through the boot. You can have them wiggle their toes. Um, it just provides more protection from the elements to leave their boot on. Now obviously pre-hospital situations in town will go ahead and take their shoe off and then uh, do the full assessment. So what we see, uh, the picture on the right, we have a SAM splint and the SAM splint is used for a tib-fib fracture and uh, the ankle stirrup essentially is, is what it's called here. So basically we're just providing a sand splint that goes behind the ankle, runs all the way up, and it goes a little bit past the knee. We can wrap it with our Curlix or our Ace Wrap and uh, we have now isolated the joints above and below. So a lot of people when I, I teach mountain medicine courses, they ask how do I uh, splint and how do I stabilize somebody who has either a humerus fracture or has a potential dislocation of the shoulder and for whatever reason it seems like it's it's always a deficit a lot of people don't know specifically how to um, properly and, and efficiently immobilize the humerus um, so yes you could lay their arm all the way out flat and you could run a sand splint up both sides and you could wrap it and they'd have this really like precarious awkward long splint on and that's okay um, but this is an option as well so this is called a humeral coaptation splint and essentially what you're doing is creating a sugar tongue that goes from the mid axillary armpit uh, area it then wraps all the way underneath the <coughs> uh, joint hinge joint at the elbow it goes then all the way up the humerus and then a little bit of the splint actually kind of wraps back almost to the area around the scapula and then you can wrap it with your ace wrap and you can leave um, a little bit of padding in between the mid-axillary region as well, and this immobilizes the joint above and below uh, any humerus fracture as well. And if you have somebody who has a uh, potential uh, dislocation of their shoulder, this can be used for that as well. So pelvic fractures are something that we see quite commonly in pre-hospital medicine, and keep in mind that these can absolutely be life-threatening and they're life-threatening because of hemorrhage loss. So we can lose anywhere from about uh, a liter, liter and a half, um, potentially two liters of blood into our pelvic cavity if we have um, specific um, damage due to mechanism of injury uh, large enough to cause shock. 
And so with pelvic fractures, one of the best things to do for these patients is to immobilize their pelvis. And we're immobilizing it because we assume that if they are in shock or if they do have any type of unstable pelvis on your exam, they most likely have a open book pelvic fracture or potential fracture. And so in this situation, what we can do is take a, basically a, a big cavity, um, and that's now a larger cavity because it's fractured, and we can then take um, any type of immobilizing device, specifically in this picture, this is the sand splint commercial device, but you could also take a sheet, a blanket, roll it up, whatever you choose to do is fine, but basically put it below their iliac crest, and it actually sits quite low on their hips, and uh, then go ahead and, and put a little bit of um, pressure on either side and wrap it down, tie it down, however you choose to do it. And this will close that open book fracture, decreasing the container size of the volume. It can also really alleviate some pain as well. So in these situations, we've probably been taught in, in EMT school and in paramedic school to uh, do that whole rocking, you know, as I'm doing this lecture, holding quotations up, I don't know why I'm doing that. But anyway, so the point is, um, you know, doing rocking of the pelvis. And um, in that situation, when you're assessing the person's pelvis, just be really careful. And you know, there's no need to like, truly rock their pelvis and give it a good sturdy exam. Um, if there's any pain upon gentle light palpation of their pelvis, then it's better just to assume that they have some type of pelvic injury and go ahead and immobilize and um, put some type of pelvic binder on. Because if you actually do, you know, do the classic thing where they want you to press in and press down on the pelvis, you could potentially make that open book fracture far worse, increase bleeding, increase pain. So if there's any light pain on very light palpation of that pelvis, just go ahead and wrap it and go from there. So as we talked about, bed sheets are good. Um, commercial C clamps, if you choose to buy those. Mass pants work effectively for this. Um, probably one of the best things out there is the full body of vacu splint, and uh, specifically the new uh, new design of the full body of vacu splint has a built-in pelvic immobil immobilizer. Um, so a lot of different commercial products out there, but just know whatever you, you uh, typically use for this and make sure that you know how to apply it. So femur fractures also can be life-threatening. We can lose up to uh, a liter to a liter and a half of blood within each femur cavity. So imagine the person with bilateral femur fractures and also a pelvic fracture as well. They have the potential to lose quite a lot of blood, um, actually enough to make them go into uh, very severe stages of shock. So as we know, it takes a great amount of mechanism of injury, a great amount of force to actually cause a femur fracture. And so we typically see other injuries associated with a femur fracture. There's only been a few times where I've actually seen just an isolated mid-shaft femur fracture without any other associated injuries. It's quite rare to see that. Um, the majority of the time we will have other associated injuries. The times when I've seen just the isolated femur fracture have been people up in the mountains who have uh, basically tripped, their leg has somehow gotten locked between a rock and they fall specifically with the injury just to that leg but do not injure themselves otherwise. So. Femur fractures can typically be stabilized with all of the different type of commercial devices. So whatever you choose to use, make sure that you're proficient at it and you know how to use it. So the hair traction splint, very common, uh, Sager traction splint. The KTD, the Kendrick traction device, is the one that unfolds and basically has a tent pole that unfolds and provides as a traction splint, which we typically like to use in the mountains uh, because it's lightweight and you can carry it uh, easily in a pack. Some of these other devices are a bit heavy, a bit precarious. Also, we can potentially use mass pants as well, although keep in mind that mass pants won't do anything for traction, but they will do something as far as stabilization is concerned. Okay, so rib fractures. So rib fractures happen from uh, injury to the ribs, essentially, but the issue is, is that we have the potential to have uh, very big underlying issues as far as anatomy and what can be injured um, underneath the ribs. So the first thing that is of primary concern with rib fractures is uh, our lungs essentially. And so um, when we have rib fractures, it's important to continuously check the person's lung sounds to al always evaluate for the potential of a building pneumothorax or tension pneumothorax um, and be ready to treat that. Could also have cardiovascular issues, uh, pericardial tamponade, things like this uh, from rib and sternal fractures as well. And we could also have abdominal organ issues. You could have some of the more distal ribs, um, or sorry, some of the more inferior ribs 
uh, have an issue with uh, puncturing abdominal organs or puncturing through the diaphragm potentially, uh, depending on the situation. So um, just do a, a good evaluation and keep in mind that there can absolutely be underlying issues with rib fractures. So we need careful evaluation to rule out um, intrathoracic abdominal injuries, so do that physical exam. Um, in the hospital to do imaging studies, uh, whether that's uh, CT or ultrasound, um, also do lab studies as well. So the primary treatment for rib fractures, obviously, if we need to needle decompress the chest because of an pneumothorax, we do that initially. But the main treatment for rib fractures is really analgesia. Um, and to be quite honest, uh, it's been thrown around in, in a lot of uh, EMS classes over the years. As, as far as how to stabilize the rib fractures and how to, how to effectively do that. And really it just comes down to giving the person pain control and letting them find their position of comfort. So whether it's them guarding it, uh, providing a pillow so they can self-guard their rib fractures, or if they have multiple trauma, um, it probably won't be an issue. But the big thing here is giving them analgesia for pain. Um, and the interesting thing about giving them analgesia for pain is that you'll actually see an improvement in their respiratory status because they'll go from very shallow respirations to having somewhat normal respirations. So amputations. So amputations is the life over limb uh, situation. So with an amputation, we need to ensure that we have initially proper evaluation of our ABCs. Make sure you take care of the bleeding loss. Um, stop the hemorrhaging as soon as you can. And as soon as you've done your assessment, you stop the hemorrhaging, then you can start to worry about how to prepare and transport that amputated uh, part. So the best and most recommended thing to do is to actually take Ringer's lactate, which has been shown to improve tissue um, or actually sustain tissue. Um, so take some Ringer's lactate, you can clean it, wrap it in a moist and sterile gauze, place it in a plastic bag, transport it on ice, although you do not want it to actually be directly on ice, you need some type of barrier there. So um, if it's in some gauze with a plastic bag, you can put it in ice, that's fine. Um, so in that situation, that's really the best protocol to go with. If you don't have to, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you don't have time to clean it, if you're uh, you know, transporting rapidly on scene, that's absolutely fine. Throw it in a plastic bag. We'll first wrap it in just some moist uh, gauze, throw it in a plastic biohazard bag or whatever you have on scene and then get it to, uh, to the ER. So something that's a potential concern, not necessarily on scene for the majority of pre-hospital calls, but let's say if you're with a patient for a continuous amount of time, anywhere from uh, you know an hour to two hours, or if you happen to see a patient, let's say, who had a, a broken arm, they decided not to go to the ER later that evening, they have a lot of pain uh, at the site or, or continued pain, swelling, things like that, you could potentially see compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome can result from isolated fractures, specifically from crush injuries and also from internal hemorrhage as well. And essentially what's happening is we have a shift of fluid from the intravascular space to the interstitial space, which is also known as the third space. And this increases the pressure in this isolated uh, fascial compartment. So essentially our muscle is covered by a thin layer of fascia. The fascia doesn't stretch. Once we have this increased pressure, the muscle starts to try to stretch inside of that compartment. And when it basically reaches the fascial area, um, in the interfascial compartment, the muscle is not able to move and so it starts to essentially die. And um, when this happens, the muscle then starts to basically leak out um, myoglobin, which is just muscle, uh, muscle byproducts essentially, and it leaks it out onto the vascular system. Myoglobin is a very big protein and so um, it can eventually make its way and it will make its way to the kidneys and that can potentially put the person in renal failure failure, although that's not the primary concern, at least initially with these patients. And it can also put them into rhabdo as well, because we'll have uh, an increase, net increase in uh, potassium uh, in, our, in our blood system, essentially. And they'll go into a state of uh, metabolic acidosis. <clears throat> so the early stages and early signs and symptoms are vague of compartment syndrome, but we have to go back to the six Ps. So with the six Ps, we have to look at all of these and if they have the six Ps, and specifically they'll have all of them, um, this will be a late sign, then they will uh, consider a compartment syndrome and most likely treat it um, with surgical intervention. Although what's nice nowadays is that they have the ability to monitor the pressure in the specific compartment via a transducer. And so basically they induce this transducer, um, it's connected to a catheter, 
um, and then they essentially get a, a reading of the pressure within that cavity and they're then able to then decide if they need to actually do surgical intervention, intervention, specifically a fasciotomy, to relieve that pressure. So once again, it all goes back to the six Ps. So we do the six Ps initially on scene, and then it's uh, important to do the six Ps as we continue down um, the stages of healthcare uh, for these patients. So let's talk about pharmacology for orthopedic trauma. So the first thing that we'll talk about is something that is not widely used in pre-hospital medicine currently for uh, orthopedic trauma or really at all, uh, but it's something that's quite um, commonly given in hospital, whether it's uh, an emergency department, urgent care, um, any type of clinic. So this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, specifically NSAIDs, and NSAIDs decrease inflammation can also relieve some pain, and they relieve pain secondary to inflammation. So the most commonly used agents would be ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, uh, aspirin, ketoprofen. Um, probably the most common one as far as being somewhat of an emergent type of drug would be ketorolec, which is also known as Toradol. And Toradol is becoming a popular drug, and Toradol is actually pretty good at relieving mild to moderate pain, and has been shown to definitely decrease pain for patients who have uh, specific orthopedic injuries. Uh, so you'll probably be seeing a little bit more of ketorolec, especially in the hospital, um, but potentially pre-hospital as well. So really the standard of care for orthopedic trauma as far as emergency care is concerned is an opiate analgesic. Keep in mind that opiate analgesic can be used with NSAIDs, uh, giving some morphine, fentanyl, and also giving uh, Toradol on top of it is a great combination. So commonly used agents for opiates would be morphine, uh, hydrocodone, fentanyl, oxycodone, hydromorphone, um, any of the, the typical opiates. Um, probably the best one here would be fentanyl just because of its short half-life or transport times. Um, a short half-life can be good and bad in, in most pre-hospital situations, it's a good thing. Um, but fentanyl also does have a little bit more of a euphoric effect than morphine, very rapid onset, and we also really don't see an issue with, uh, with huge respiratory compromise. Now it, it can absolutely, and it is a CNS depressant, so if you give enough of it, it will cause that. Um, but initially we don't see a, a huge concern with it. Now, what you do see with fentanyl, or excuse me, what you do not see with fentanyl is its uh, hemodynamic effects. Now, it, it will cause it, and if in high doses, if you give enough fentanyl, it will absolutely cause a person's blood pressure to drop. Um, but initially, given the doses that we typically get pre-hospital, anywhere from 100 micrograms to 200 micrograms, we're not really seeing a, a huge effect on any type of hemodynamic instability with the patient like we see uh, giving a lot of morphine to a patient as far as its vasodilatory effects and its effects of uh, increasing some workload on the heart. And also we have these potential side effects, and we just talked about these, so respiratory depression, hypotension, nausea and vomiting, sedation, and physical dependence as well. So in the nausea and vomiting category, keep in mind that you, uh, you may have access to give an anti-emetic. So a great anti-emetic for any type of opiate is Finergan, uh, also known as promethazine. Got to be a little bit careful with that, or not necessarily, it's just that um, Finergan does have the potential side effect of uh, dystonic reactions, so basically um, having the person um, potentially have hallucinations, they could um, go into a state of uh, hyperventilation, kind of freaking out a little bit. These are all dystonic reactions uh, secondary specifically to Finergan administration. Um, and if that does happen, the antidote is quite easy for that, which is uh, Benadryl. And Benadryl is actually kind of the cheap man's anti-emetic and actually works quite well for um, control of nausea and vomiting. So if you have to give Benadryl because the Finergan is making them freak out a little bit, it's perfectly fine to give. Um, in some situations, given your protocols, just in some personal situations, I've given uh, morphine, Finergan, and then just Benadryl right off the bat. And these have usually been um, extended care situations where I wanted to provide a little bit more sedation for the patient. Um, also, nausea and vomiting, if you have access to Zofran, great drug to give for nausea and vomiting, uh, with great drug really with little side effects, um, main side effect just being a headache.
And then we have muscle relaxants, which in pre-hospital medicine, probably the most underused uh, medication specifically for orthopedic injuries. So muscle relaxants reduce pain from muscle spasm. They um, also reduce pain from muscle spasm due to dislocation as well. And if you are trying to relocate a dislocated extremity in the field, giving a muscle relaxant can mean the difference between actually um, reducing the dislocation or not. They also help reduce injury. They do have some side effects. They have some slight hypotension issues, not as much as morphine though. Um, they do have respiratory depression issues, not as much as morphine. Um, they do have sedation um, and they can cause high, highly sedation or high sedation issues. Um, but overall, the side effects of muscle relaxants are usually not as profound as the side effects of uh, morphine given in kind of concurrent doses. And obviously, if we give a lot of Versed to somebody or a lot of Valium to somebody, then yeah, you're going to have these side effects. So just know that this can absolutely happen. So the commonly, uh, most commonly used agents, Valium and Versed, um, if I had to pick between one of these two, I'd pick Versed just because of its amnesic effects. Um, you know, if you need to pull traction on somebody's finger or reduce their extremity because it's pulseless, you can give them some Versed initially, uh, your standard protocol dose, and, uh, and then you can go ahead and reduce it and they won't have that little lovely memory in their head anymore.